today's class, we're going to talk about Esau, Rome, Herod, and Khazars. Let's go to Genesis 25 and 21. This is now after the flood. Genesis 25 and verse 21. This is way after the flood. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. So the children that was inside Rebekah were warring. They were fighting. Read. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? If it is a blessing, why does it feel like there's a war up in my belly? What's going on in my stomach, in my womb? Go ahead. And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. So the Lord now revealed. In your womb is the beginning of two nations. That don't mean 30 million people. 30 million people is in her stomach. Two boys are in her womb, which would be the forefathers of two nations. Read. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy vows. Meaning two different types of people would be separated. I want you to look at that word. They're separated from your vows. Read. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. That's why a lot of people are amazed at how our people were suffered for so many years, but was able to endure it. And how we take over the sports field. Whatever we get in, we dominate. People are amazed at this thing. Read. And the elder shall serve the younger. So now the Lord says the elder boy, whichever boy comes out first, shall be a servant, a slave to the younger boy. Read. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now we know they were not identical, right? How do we know they weren't identical? How do we know? It, it will be two separate nations. All right. Two manner, two, two manner I'm sorry. of people two would manner. be separated. That's how you know they would not be identical. Read on, Isaac. Verse 25. And the first came out red, all over, like in hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. So the first boy came out red. The blood was just showing all through his skin. And they called his name Esau. Esau means wasted away. When you get the, uh, there's only one book I've seen the meaning, and that was the, which I don't subscribe to this book, but there's some good and there's a lot of bones in it. Ben Yehuda's uh, Hebrew, English, English, Hebrew dictionary. The name there, proper name, was supposed to be Aishashua, which means wasted away. But when you look into the Torah, Esau changed a lot of the names. That's why a lot of y'all, when y'all be looking up Adam, if you look up the Hebrew word for Adam and the Hebrew word for Edom, they got the same name up in there. Esau went in there and did a lot of mess up. That's why I tell y'all, you can look it up, but don't get confused. Verse 26. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. So when y'all are explaining this, you want to let the reader know, or the person you're teaching, they did not mention Jacob's color. Jacob's color is not mentioned because Jacob looked like everybody else on the planet. They mention Esau's color in verse 25 because he was different. Esau is Cain coming back in the earth again, not paying for his crimes. Read. Verse 27. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. Does not white people love to hunt? They love to hunt. They be putting, they, a guy I work with, talk, he goes bear hunting. He be spritzing bear piss on his shoes. I said, what the hell you doing bear piss? He said, it draws the bear. I said, you stupid as hell. You're going to get put to death. Huh? You keep hunting them bears. Yogi going to get you one day. Keep playing. <laughs> Go ahead. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. Isaac loved Esau. He's, Esau hunts his own food. He does his own. Esau's my man. So J Isaac loved Esau. Read. But Rebecca loved Jacob. I will always remember that. Uh, Rebecca loved Jacob. She said, this is the boy the Most High promised would be the, the top one in the earth. Go ahead. And Jacob sighed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, 
with that same red pottage. And in that pottage, there was rare meat. All right, when you go to, just get that real quick in Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Notice it says one morsel of meat, of meat, of meat. That's why when we go back to Genesis 25, where it talks about the red pottage, what made it red? That rare meat up in there. The rare meat, because that's how they like their food. Rare. Have not even had, is bloody. They like it with the blood dripping out. And if you like it like that, check your genealogy. <laughs> right. Where you at, Captain? Genesis chapter 25 and verse 30. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Now when you look up the name Edom, it means red, red. That's what that same red pottage, meaning that same red pottage that looks like you. That same red, that rare meat that's in there, making everything red, that looks just like you, I want that. Looks just like Esau. That's what he said he wanted. Okay, everybody with me so far? Yes, sir. That's what's going on. So now, when you go to 2 Ezra 6, let's go there real quick. The prophet Ezra explains about Jacob taking hold of Esau's heel. Hello. I want you, if you notice, among, the all, among all the nations, every nation in history has a record of being dark. The Arabs are dark. The Africans are dark. East Indians, East Indians are dark. Koreans dark, but there's no record of dark-skinned Caucasians. They've always been pale from the very beginning. That's how you know who Esau is according to the Bible. Because there's no record of him ever being dark ever in history. You go in the history of all the other nations, they all have a history of being like unto the earth. Right. The that proves that he goes back to being Cain all over again. You know what they say? They go, oh, well, you, uh, people get dark because of their climate, their environment. The white folks in South Africa have been there almost 500 years. They ain't turned black yet. Where are we going? Second Ezra, chapter 6 and verse 7. Then answered I and said, What shall be the parting asunder of the times? When will be the end of the age? That's what he says, the parting asunder of the time. When shall the end of the world be? That's the question. Read. Or when shall be the end of the first and the beginning of it? that follow so this world that we live in he's asking when is it going to be done away with and god's kingdom come in that is what he's asking read and he said unto me from abraham unto isaac when jacob and esau were born of him jacob's hand held first the heel of esau so now he explains jacob and esau go ahead for esau is the end of the world so when jacob grabbed esau's heel ezra is getting it explained now what that means. Read that again, Captain. For Esau is the end of the world. All that represents when Jacob grabbed Esau's heel, it represents Esau would be the end of the world. Read. And Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. So he's letting us know that Esau would be the last ruling Gentile power on the earth. Now that make them, make them think about during the time of Ezra. Who was ruling during the time of Ezra? Persian. Persians, the Persians and the Medes were in rulership. That's the East Indians and um, the Hawaiians, Filipinos, uh, Polynesians, Samoans, all of them. That's them. They were ruling at that time. Second Ezra 6 and verse 9. <clears throat> For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. What verse you in? Verse 10. That was it? Now, from there, go to Obadiah. I want to show you the same thing in the book of Obadiah. What we read in Genesis 25 that was explained in 2 Ezra 6, 7 through 9, Obadiah makes mention of it here. The last verse. The book of Obadiah, <laughs> verse 21. Yeah. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Watch this. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Y'all see that? So... Esau, right, even Obadiah is saying, when Esau is judged, the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Letting you know, again, Esau is the last 
ruling Gentile empire. You brothers see that? Yes, sir. Now, let's get into a parable where it says the same thing but in parable form. That's why you got to know Genesis 25, 2 Ezra 6, 7 through 9, Obadiah verse 21, because when we go to Revelation now, it's going to say the same thing. Give me that. Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 10. The book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. And there was war in heaven. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. So now you read this. You're reading about the angels of heaven warring against Satan and his angels. And you go, Christianity jumps in your head. Y yeah, Lucifer came from the pits of hell and was fighting with spirits. Yeah, okay. Let's read on. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Which deceiveth the whole world. Go ahead. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. Watch this. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So what is this talking about? This is a twofold parable here. Now we know the spiritual aspect of it. What is the physical aspect making reference to? Let's see who can draw the line. In verse 9, when I say the dragon was cut out, it's about the, the kingdom of Esau. Very good. I'm glad you brought it like that. This is the kingdom of Esau. That's what he's talking about. That's why I took y'all from Genesis to Ezra to Obadiah, now in Revelation. That's why a lot of you who grew up in Christianity, you read this, and you don't know what the hell it's talking about. Why? Because your lying pastors taught you, don't read the Old Testament. Don't read it, don't read it, don't read it. Thank you. So when you read this, you're like all confused. You're thinking about Damien. Right, notice it says that old serpent, meaning that same spirit from Genesis that came in the personage of Cain, that came back through Esau, is that same old serpent. That's the same guy. That same spirit right there. Right, that accuses the brethren day and night. We're the thieves of the earth. We're the liars. We're the adulterers. They accuse the Israelites of being the worst things. Of it. You think of anything bad, they got our people's faces right there. Always. They accuse us on the media all the time. And they never do nothing wrong. But it's always us. From there, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Now I'm going back in history now. Back during the time of Esau. I want y'all to pay attention and stay with me. Stay with me. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 12. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 12. The Horems also dwelt in Seir. Now these are, these are Hamites, the Horems. Go ahead. The Horems also dwelt in Seir. Also called Horites. Go ahead. Before time. But the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. So now, Esau took the land of Seir from the Horems. Okay? Why? Because we read in Genesis that they would be what? And vagabonds. They'd be everywhere. But now, it says just like Israel did to uh, the land of his possession. But yes, there's a difference there. Why did Israel take the land of Canaan? Because God promised the Israelites the land of Israel. Right. God promised the land to Israel. Now I want something deeper than that now. I want to go deeper. Not only did the Most High promise to us, that's correct, you're right, but something else. This whole earth is created for us. Thank you. The whole earth was made for the Israelites. Everything on this planet belongs to us. That's why I want you to give me that scripture in Genesis about Genesis 9, Gen 27. Genesis 9. Wait, wait, wait. Start at 26. Verse 26. No, no, start at 25. I'm sorry. Verse 25. Y'all bear with me a second. I just, it's been a while since I looked at this. Go ahead. The start book, at Genesis 9, 25. The book of Genesis, chapter 9 and verse 25. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, 
A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. If you have a servant and your servant has anything, who does it belong to? You. Canaan became our servant. I want y'all to listen good. Canaan became our servant. Go ahead. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Shem is our forefather. Out of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the Israelites descend from Shem. Read. And Canaan shall be his servant. Canaan shall be our servant. Everybody see that so far? Read. God shall enlarge Japheth. Now this is the other boy. God shall enlarge Japheth. Read. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. So where would the Japheth seed live? In our lands. That's why, that's why when the brother said in the back, the earth was made for us, you don't act like that was something new. That was from way back here. The most everything on this planet belongs to Shem's descendants, the Israelites. Everything. Japheth, you just renting. Canaan, you a servant. Because this whole planet was made for Israel. Give me that second, second Ezra 6. Second Ezra chapter 6 and verse 55. Also this have I spoken before thee, O Lord, because thou madest the world for our sakes. Mm -hmm. As for the other people, which also come of Adam. The children of Japheth, the children of Ham and Canaan. Thou hast said that they are nothing. They are nothing. They are nothing. And those are the other kids that came from Shem, which are not descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible says they are what? That they are nothing, but be like unto spittle. They're like the spit that comes out your mouth. And has likened the abundance of them. And has likened the greatest of them, the majority of them, all of them. Unto a drop that falleth from a vessel. Who worries about a drop of water that falls from a cup? Nobody. You don't give a damn about that one drip. Read that thing about the abundance of them again, because they didn't get it, Elder. You think they got it. They didn't get it. Verse 56. As for the other people, which also come of Adam, thou hast said that they are nothing. Thou hast said that they are nothing. That's coming out of Isaiah. He said, you said that they were nothing, Lord. But Go be ahead. like unto spittle. And you said that they were like unto spit. And Go it has... Ahead. Go ahead. And has likened the abundance of them. That's the part I want to focus on real quick. And has likened the abundance of them. You know what the Most High is saying? He said that if you put them all together, that's what the abundance means. You gather them all up, every last single one of them. All of them together is worth nothing. That's what he's saying. Read that statement. And has likened the abundance of them. So he ain't talking about a few nations. He said if you were to gather all the nations up together and put them on a scale. That's what he's saying. You gather them all together, every last one of them, and put them on a scale. Until a drop that falleth from a vessel. He said one drop way more than all of them to him. One drop of water way more than all of them put together on a scale. You know what is heavy? <laughs> because a lot of us, when, it, when Christ said ye must be born again, he meant that thing, because a lot of us, we come in the street, we're not born again. When you're on the street, what is the first thing black people say when you bring out this truth? What about the other nations? What about the white man? Why? Because in their mind, the white man and the other nations are so important. But when you read the Bible and God says they are nothing, our people don't, can't really accept that. No, they're so great. They're so wonderful. That's not what the, you won't find that in the Bible. The Bible says they are nothing. You brothers understand that? Uh-huh, we'll see. Now, let's get, I, I got to go to Romans 9, just verse 7. I didn't want to go here, but since it didn't hit y'all in the head, because somebody in here right now may be thinking, not my Jesus. Not my Jesus. They're going to church tomorrow. They got the shoes on now. The pointy black church shoes, some of them are wearing them right now. Might be white. White church shoes. Never trust a man with white leather shoes. <laughs> yeah, with the white tube socks. <laughs> Romans 9 and 7. The book of Romans, chapter 9 Let's and verse... Let's start at 11. Well, no, start at 7. We're going to read down. Romans 9 and verse... Start at 6. Romans 9 and verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Some of you think the Bible is not in effect. The Bible is in full effect, brothers and sisters. Whether you believe it or not, 
Whether you're in this truth or not, the Bible's prophecies are coming to pass. You better get on this train. That's all we can do. Tell you to get on this train. You miss it, shame on you. There's a missile coming for you. Go ahead. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Meaning there are many Israelites, two-thirds, which will not repent. Some of them are your mothers, your fathers, sisters, and brothers. They will not repent. Wives, husbands, they will not repent. Read. Neither, because they are the, of the, are the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? So Paul says just because they came out of Abraham does not make them the children. Meaning what? The children of God. Because Abraham had more than just um, Isaac. Who else did Abraham have? Ishmael. Who else? Remember when Sarah died, he married Keturah. And he had a whole bunch. The Midianites came out of Abraham. Okay? A lot of people came out of Abraham. Read that again, Captain. Neither, because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children. Meaning, are they all children of God? That's what he's talking about. Who are the children of God? That's the subject. Read. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So Paul reminds us. He said, in Isaac shall the seed be called. Meaning what seed? The seed of God is coming from Isaac. Read. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. Meaning the other nations are the children of the flesh. Read. These are not the children of God. Read that again. These are not the children of God. So even in the New Testament, the Bible is telling you the children of the flesh, meaning the other nations, regardless if they come from Abraham, they are not the children of God. Your pastors won't teach you that. Your pastor's telling you everybody's a child of God. Everybody. Go ahead. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Right. The children of the promise are the Israelites. It tells you that in verse 4. Read verse 4. Verse 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the Lord and the service of God and the promises? You see the promises? That's what we wanted to touch on because that's what we just read here about the promises. It only pertains to the Israelites. It does not pertain to other nations. To whom, I, to whom pertaineth the adoption? What is the adoption? What is the adoption? Somebody raise your hand and answer it. Read it again. Read that statement again, the fourth verse. Romans 9 and verse 4. Who are Israelites? So the subject matter is about the Israelites, right? Is it about other nations? No, sir. So it's only about the Israelites. Right. Okay, keep reading. To whom pertaineth the adoption. What does whom mean? Um, <clears throat> it's talking about a people. Right. Whom is prejudice. <laughs> whom is segregation. <laughs> okay. Whom means I'm only talking about that, those, them. That's what whom is. To whom pertaineth. What does pertain mean? Belong to. To these people belongeth what? Belong to. Belong to what? What belongs to them? The adoption. What is the adoption? Christ dying on the cross for our sins. So if the churches would have understood that, the, the churches would be blown up because you can't teach, you can't have other nations in there yep, jumping up and down screaming because the, the whole church system was based on Christ. And Christ said, in the Bible, it's telling you Christ only died for Israelites. To whom belongeth the dying of Christ on the cross only belongs to the nation of Israel. So these churches are a bunch of garbage. That's what it is. Okay. And, and again, can I add one more thing? Oh, the y'all got to look at how long ago this was written. Why would Paul have to put emphasis on it? It's the same problem we're facing right now. He had to deal with back then. He had to remind them the other nations they're not in this because what does Christianity run to? As I said before, with Adam, they're gonna say we all come from one blood. When they finish with Adam, who they go to next? Father Abraham, he's a father of what? Many nations, that's what you hear in Christianity. So these things are gonna help you to lay the foundation, to let the people know slowly, you ain't part of this. Exactly, go back to Romans 9. Romans 9 and verse nine. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. So he's explaining a promise now. Go ahead, thank you. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, 
neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So the one that the boy that God was going to choose had nothing to do with their works. Esau didn't come out and do something wicked and God get mad and say, well, I'm choosing Jacob because of this. It had nothing to do. That's what Paul is saying here. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, meaning who God elects to be the chosen, that's who he's electing. What is, Paul is quoting Genesis. That's what he's doing. Because the birth of Esau and Jacob has said the same thing. He chose Jacob to be the sons of the Most High before they even did anything. He made the decision right there in the womb. He said, the reason why these two kids are fighting in your womb, Rebecca, is because I did it. I'm the one that's doing it. I'm the one that chose Jacob to be uh, over Esau before they were even born. <laughs> so if a person is still arguing with you after the scripture comes out about the other nations, what's the next thing you do? You dismiss, there's nothing else to talk about because the scripture just said, listen, this takes me out of the equation that this is my personal feelings and brings us to the fact that God don't like you if you're a heathen. So when you take them there, this ends the argument. If they're still going on, you are a fool for continuing to speak with them because you just took your personal feelings out of it and said, take this up with God. Read on. Verse 12. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So you can't change what the Bible says. This is, what are we reading? The New Testament. You know why we always stress that? Because you get these Christians that say, that ain't in the New Testament. Yes, it is in the New Testament. God don't like Esau. He hates Esau. God don't hate, yes, he does. Read it again. What did we just read? As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So that goes for your Edomite friends. I know some of you got them out there on your job. We all got them on the jobs, too. Some of us got Edomites in our families. Your aunt, I know my aunt, married went out, married a white man. Listen, she said, you want to come over for dinner? No. Hey, God don't like him. What do you mean God don't like him? God don't like him. Many years ago, I'm going to tell you all something. And Elder, I have been looking for this clip. I got it somewhere, but I cannot find it. You remember the, the uh, TV talk show, Ricky Lake? On her show, when, I'm talking about way back, 20 years ago. That's how far back we go. And she had on her Reverend Phelps. Yep. You remember Reverend Phelps? Yep. Yep. Reverend Phelps had his disciple, student, beside him. Mm -hmm. remember that. And the audience was attacking Reverend Phelps because of his, Reverend Phelps because of his controversial uh, viewpoint about the Bible. Turn or burn, he was against homosexuals, gays, he said they all gonna burn up. And they were like mad at him. So they were blasting him. Then his student spoke up for him. He said, you know what, I'm tired of y'all disrespecting my mentor and my elder. And he That's said, what he said. Are, yeah, he said, what are y'all gonna do with Romans 9, 13, where the Lord, this is a white boy speaking, he's dumb behind, he didn't realize he was talking about himself. Right. He, said, he said, what are y'all gonna do with Romans 9, 13, where it says, that Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I not disliked, not felt bad about, but he hated him. He hated Esau, and he was adamant about saying this. Man, I fell out the chair. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. But they never repeated that again. Right, Somehow no. the producers got They said, what the hell is going on here? They won't even the, put that on YouTube. They won't even put that on you. You cannot find that video nowhere. Now, I know now, I got the tape somewhere. I got to find it. Lord have mercy. If I find that thing, it's going to be earth shattering. <laughs> So I know the feds is on me now. Yeah, they're on you. They're on you, bro. Uh, Captain, let's go um, Genesis 27. We're going back now to Genesis 27 now about the blessing upon Esau. Genesis 27, 34. The book of Genesis, chapter 27 and verse 34. Now, when you read this, Jacob, his eyes are dim, his time, his life is almost cut short. He's about to die. He tells his mama, says, look, Jacob, I want you to go in there and get your father's first blessing. Because the first blessing is supposed to go on who? 
the firstborn. The firstborn is supposed to get the blessing. So the mama now intervened. She says, listen, y'all can read the whole history in your own. I'm just going to brief you. Jacob, go in there and get the blessing from your father. He says, Ma, me and my brother Esau is different. I don't look like him. I don't sound like him. She said, listen, here, put this sheep, this goat's hair on you. Rub it on you so you smell like your brother. And with the long hair, you're going to feel like your brother too. And change your voice a little bit. Go and you go in there. He says, Ma, you going to get me cursed. God going to curse me. She said, let the curse fall on me. So when she said that, she knew it wasn't going to be no curse because the Most High already told her and Isaac the youngest boy would get the blessing. That's why she was not scared about it. Now, let's read. So now, Jacob blesses, uh, I'm not Jacob. Isaac blesses Jacob. He said, is this my boy Esau? Yeah. Yeah. He said, it feel like Esau. Smell like Esau, but it kind of sound like Jacob. No. <laughs> Genesis 27 and verse 34. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry. Because Esau came in for his blessing. And his daddy, Isaac, said, listen, the blessing I had for you, oh my goodness, I just gave to your younger brother. And Esau saw crying and crying and crying. Read. He cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, bless me. Even me also, O oh my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtility and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob, for he hath supplanted me these two times? Right, that's what his name means, supplanter, Jacob. He, right? he took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. Wait, wait, I got a question. Did Esau give a damn about his birthright? He already sold that daggone thing. You got to see, that's when people be saying, oh, it's a Jacob tricked him. Esau got, he didn't care about the birthright. He said, uh, when you read the history, give me that red pottage and I'll give you my birthright. So Esau didn't give a damn about it. This all lies from Esau. Read. He took away my birthright and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord. I made Jacob, the Israelites, your Lord. Read. And all his brethren have I given to him for servants. Mm. Go ahead. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Go ahead, read on. Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. So now comes the blessing that the Lord is using to put on Esau. It says, Your dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, meaning you and your descendants will live in the best places on the earth. Read. And of the dew of heaven from above. Meaning, when the dew comes down from heaven, it covers everything. Meaning, Esau would be everywhere. Read. And by the sword shalt thou live. So now that answers the first part. When it says, they shall have the fatness of the earth. How would they dwell in the fatness of the earth? And how would they be able to live everywhere? That, what we just read, answered the question. By their sword thou shalt live. What does that mean? They were blessed with what? War. The art of war. Esau has the spirit of war upon them. That's why they don't vote for nothing. They want something, they come with what? Violence. Violence. They don't vote. They tell you to vote, but they will, they will violent. They are a violent race. Read. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. And you shall serve your brother, meaning be a, sl a slave. Read. And it shall come to pass, 
when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. You can read about that in the book of Kings. During the time of Solomon's reign, when Solomon was ruling, it said the nation of Edom broke out from under Solomon. Okay? But that ain't the end of it. Okay, what verse was that Isaac you just said? That was verse 40. That was verse 40. Now, here's my question. They would dwell in the fatness of the earth. All y'all pay attention. They would dwell in the fatness of the earth. They would be as the dew of heaven, and by their sword shalt thou live. When did that prophecy start, start to come to pass? Um, when Alexander the Great was the beginning of the reign. Correct. Alexander in the Greek, 333 B.C. Write that down. 333 B.C. One of the elders used to ask the Edomites right. that. He used to ask him, he said, Mr. White Man! Tell me, when is the beginning of white power structure in the earth? And they sit there and turn red. They couldn't figure out. They said, what the hell? They could not figure it out at all. Right. And you know why? Because they've been lied to. Not only have we been lied to, their own peons have been lied to because they think they're everybody. When you look at Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, not only is white folks the I Israelites, they're the Egyptians. They're everybody. They're everybody. Look at all them old Bible movies. They're everybody. Here come the Babylonians, white folks running right, there. Right. The Goliath, David and Goliath. White folks is Goliath. What the hell is this? White folks is David too. Right, now they're the Arabs. They're everybody. They are everybody. So when that question came up, they were dumbfounded. Exactly. Where we at, Captain? First book of Maccabees, chapter 1 and verse 1. So what we're about to read is the beginning of Genesis 27 and verse 34 down. 40, the beginning of white power in the earth. Go ahead. And white it, power! Go ahead. And it happened. <laughs> After that, Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chedom, had smitten Darius, king of the Persian and Medes. Right, the king of the Persians and Medes. They destroyed the East Indians. They destroyed the Polynesians, Hawaiian. They went under those titles at this time. Go ahead. That he reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. So what made Alexander different was but that because this was the first white man who could unite all white folks. This is what Hitler tried to do again. Go ahead. And made many wars. And made what? Many wars. Didn't we read, and by thy sword shalt thou live? Go ahead. And won many strongholds mm -hmm. and slew the kings of the earth. And went through the ends of the earth. Remember said they shall be as the dew of heaven, meaning everywhere. We're reading the fulfillment right here. Go ahead. And went through to the ends of the earth and took spoils of many nations, insomuch that the earth was quiet before him. Nobody could stand against Alexander. Go ahead. Whereupon he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. And he gathered a mighty strong host and ruled over countries and nations, and kings, who became tributaries unto him. Meaning everybody had to pay him taxes. Go ahead. And after these things, he fell sick. He got venereal disease, having sex with women and men, because that's what he was doing. Go ahead. And perceived that he should die. Wherefore he called his servants, such as were honorable, and had been brought up with him from his youth, and parted his kingdom among them while he was yet alive. So Alexander reigned 12 years and then died. Come on. And his servants bear rule every one in his place. And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them many years. And evils were multiplied in the earth. You see what happened when a white man got in power? Is the Bible says evils were multiplied. Evils, evils. This is another reason why they took this out of the Bible. They said, take that out, because they taught us here that civilization started with the Greeks. The Bible says, no, no, no. Evils were multiplied in the earth, meaning as bad as the earth was, it got worse when the white man got in power. This is, this is God talk. You say this to somebody, what they going to call you? You're a racist. You're a racist. And everybody, yeah, yeah, you're a racist. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, this is God talk. That's why the Bible says you must be born again. Our people are not born again. Because we read that and go, no, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe that thing. I got good white friends. And they love me. They gave me a job and a home. At Elder, yeah. did you listen to the audio clip that Yashua put up? 
I started to. I didn't hear the whole thing. That Edomite on there that got the talk show, he was making mockery of us because he says that we keep pulling out the Apocrypha books. And they laugh because they teach that the Apocrypha is not canon, mm -hmm. meaning it doesn't line up with the history in the Bible itself. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that stuff like this, you slam it in their face to show them this is why y'all pulled it out. This is one of the key points, focal points that you should use to say when they got control of our records, they said remove this and tell the rest of the people who believe in God, you don't need it. Exactly. They took it out to benefit them. They took the Apocrypha out. Now, a lot of our brothers and sisters, they all like to Google the Apocrypha, and Esau got a lot of, um, what is it called? What is that called? When you Google it. And it oh, listings. listings, that's the word. A lot of listings about the Apocrypha, like Deacon A. says, all of them negative. being not canon. Yes, it's, telling it's you negative. stay away from stay it. Stay away from it. It's evil. Okay. And Negroes go, see, you're not supposed to read that. The white man said, you're not going to read that. Remember what the British did. They beat the hell out of the West Indians because the Maroons was using the Book of the Maccabees for, for rebellion. Right. They beat the hell out of them. Right. So the ones that didn't flee into the mountains are conditioned. Right. Stay away from the Book of Maccabees. It's evil. A lot of the islands, not only in Benjamin, a lot of the islands, the Book of Maccabees were forbidden. So when I first popped an apocrypha up, they were looking at me like I had two heads asking, where did you get that book? Not supposed to be reading that. That's the trick bag they played on us. Now, hey, I got, a, I got a question. There's one New Testament scripture that proves the Apocrypha is a true book. One scripture in the New Testament. John 10, 22. Yeah, let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. John 10, 22. This proves the Apocrypha is legitimate. You got to hit a Christian with this verse in his head when he starts going off on the Apocrypha. Just read this to him. Right. Don't let him run. Grab him by the back of his neck. The book of John, chapter 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So you got to ask him, where can we read about the feast of dedication that Jesus Christ observed? It's, only, it's in the Maccabees, in the book of Maccabees. You read that in the church and the statue's going to start crying. They're going to fall down They're going to fall down and start Or, <laughs> or ask uh, Edomite to show me Hanukkah in your Bible. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, from there, let's go to 1 Maccabees chapter 8. So now, 330 B, 333 B.C. came. The Greeks came in power. All right? Now, around one, in the 160-something, around 168, 169, you had the Romans come. 1 Maccabees chapter 8. The book of 1 Maccabees. Chapter 8 and verse 1. Now Judas had heard of the frame of the Romans, that they were mighty and valiant men, and such as would lovingly accept all that joined themselves unto them, and make a league of amity with all that came unto them. So now the Roman Empire had broken off from the Greeks. Remember, these are all white folks. These are all Edomites. Rome was doing their own thing. Okay, they did not join because after Alexander died, that unity that Edomites had fell apart. It all fell apart. So now you had the Greek Empire, now you had the Roman Empire coming up in power. So at this time in Maccabees, you had those two opposing Edomite nations. Everybody with me? So now jump down to verse 11 through 16 verse to show you that America is an extension of ancient Rome. Verse Maccabees, chapter 8, 11 through 16. And it was told him besides how they destroyed and brought under their dominion all other kingdoms and isles that at any time resisted them. This is how the Romans got down. They destroyed any kingdom that went against them. Read. But with their friends and such as relied upon them, they kept amity. They kept friendship. Go ahead. And that they had conquered kingdoms both far and nigh, insomuch as all that heard of their name were afraid of them. Because Rome was rising up in power. Go ahead. Also that, whom they would help to a kingdom, those reign. Whoever Rome set up as a king or a presidential office, they reign because Rome said so. Go ahead. And whom again they would, they displace, finally. And whoever they didn't like, they displaced. Doesn't America do that same thing? They did that damn thing in Haiti. What was that dude's name? Aristide. And they told Aristide, 
you better do our demo what we say. First he said no. Then they said, okay, we won't kill your black behind you don't do what we say. Then he went back and said, okay, we do it. We do what you say, Mr. White Man. Now, and they do that, they did it in South Africa too. With broke down uh, Nelson, what's his name? Mandela. Mandela. Because the dude that went in jail as Nelson Mandela was the different Nelson Mandela that came out. The dude that went in was fiery, rebellious as hell. When he came out, he was broke. They set him up as leader over South Africa. That's what caused the divorce with him and Winnie Mandela. She said, well, Nelson, what is this? What is this? We should kill all these white people. Right. He said, no, 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 no. We cannot kill them. They were our yeah, friends. He went in there and became a Christian. Yeah, he went in there and became a Christian. They got, she got, she had to divorce this dude. And you know, they told him, get rid of Winnie. Because she's going to put that battery in your back and he's going to go back to the way you start. You was rolling before. So they got that. Esau's behind all these things. I, I want you brothers to pay attention. You're whispering in my ear. Bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, uh, this other guy from Syria, Gaddafi, and somebody else also. Mubarak, same thing. Noriega too. Right. They don't like you, they kill you. I kill you! And put somebody else in your place. Could, could you imagine how many times they went to Winnie trying to mess her mind up when her yeah. husband was locked up? And her wig was crooked to the side too. But they was trying to put all kind of, all kind of garbage in her head. <laughs> I see Azariah in the back. He got that wool going on, so I know he got something to say. Give him that microphone. <laughs> I got him. I got to hear him. The South African government tried to set Winnie Mandela up on murder charges. Too. See that? You see that? Mm. See that? They, they mm -mm -mm. tried because, hey, when you look at how she was, when, when Nelson went in jail, you saw what she was doing. They used to, they used to call her the Bushwoman of South Africa because she'd be in the bush uh, shooting guns with the uh, ANC. Yes, and you right. saw the tires, what they was doing with them tires? Yes. Setting people on fire. Yeah, she was telling all of Africans, you better get down with us. We're going to kill all the white people and get them out. Ah, they said, we got to get rid of her. Got to get rid of her. I'm telling you, bro, there's a lot going on in the earth. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. Where we at? Verse, Isaac, where we at? Verse Maccabees, chapter 8 and verse 13. Verse 13, come up. Also that, Thank whom you. they would help to kingdom those reigns. See that? And also that whom they would help to a kingdom, those reign. Go ahead. And whom again they would, they displaced. And whoever they wanted to get rid of, they displaced you, got rid of you. Go ahead. Finally, that they were greatly exalted. Rome was greatly exalted. Read. Yet for all this none of them wore a crown or was clothed in purple to be magnified thereby. Go ahead. Moreover. How they had made for themselves a senate house. Rome made a senate house. This is where America got it from. From right back here. Go ahead. Wherein 320 men sat in council daily. Now today it's not 320. What is it? It's like one some, Huh? How much is it? 100? Okay, the house is big like the senate. They got a split. Okay, thank you. Thank you. But the bottom line is they got... America's system is based on this. Go ahead. Consulting all way for the people, to the end they might be well ordered, and that they committed their government to one man every year. Now America does it every four years. They commit the government to one man every four years. And we call him what? A president. Go ahead. Who ruled over all their country, and that all were obedient to that one and that there was neither envy nor emulation among them. So now, from there, let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Four years, and if they get re-elected re again, they come back another four. Like Obama. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Let's get into this. Pay attention, pay attention. The book of Luke, chapter 1 and verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Now what I want you to look at is Herod. Herod, the king of Judea. Herod, the king of Judea. Herod, the king of Judea. Judea is another name for Judah. How was Herod? Who is Herod? Who can help me? Herod, Herod. He was a white man. He was a Idumean um, from Rome. Correct. 
Herod was a white man, a, an Edomite, an Idumean. Some of y'all got your Bible dictionaries. Who got your Bible dictionaries? Baruch, can you read that for us? Okay, right there. All right. We're going to read this first, Baruch, then you get it for me. Uh, Isaac, read that for me. Herod was born around 74 BCE in Idumea, south of Judea. He was the second son of Antipater, the Idumean. I want y'all to remember this name. Write this down. Second son of Antipater the Idumean. So now, let's go to the Bible dictionary now. Go ahead. Herod, Idumean rulers of Palestine, 47 BC to AD 79. Line started with Antipater, whom Julius Caesar made pure curator of Judea in 47 BC. Right. Um, can we look up Idumean in the Bible dictionary? Idumean. Pertaining to Edom, Greek and Roman name for Edom. So write that down, Idumean, Greek and Roman name for Edom. Okay? Now, when we look up Herod, his line began with Antipater. Okay? So now, these are all Edomites. You see at the top, very top, it says Antipater. Antipater, I'm sorry. Herod's father. He became the father of Herod the Great. Read Luke 1 and 5 again. When y'all read the Bible, I need you brothers to start to read and look at it historically also. Luke chapter 1 and verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Stop. You got to ask yourself, who is Herod? Once you find out he is an Idumean, a white man, an Edomite, how did he become king of Judah? Judah's not Edomites, are they? No. So you got to ask, how did he become king of Judea? We just read it. Where do, who can help me out? Where did we just read it? First Maccabees chapter 8 and verse 13. Also that whom they would help to a kingdom, those reigned. And whom again they would, they displaced. That's it. Remember, Rome set Herod up over Judah. Rome did that. Rome did that. What did you say? I, 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 again. Herod. Idumean rulers of Palestine. Line started with Antipater, whom Julius Caesar made pure curator of Judea in 47 BC. Y'all see that? So now, uh, let's look up the Herodians. Herodians. Look up first, give me Mark 3 and 6. Mark 3 and 6. Write this down, brothers. Mark chapter 3, verse 6. Mark chapter 3 and verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him. So you had the Pharisees take counsel with the Herodians against Christ. Let's look up the Herodians in the Bible dictionary. Get that first. Yeah, read it. Herodians, a party mentioned in the New Testament three times as joining with the Pharisees to oppose Jesus. Jews who supported the dynasty of Herod and therefore the rule of Rome. So the Herodians were Jews that supported Herod. These are your Al Sharptons, your Jesse, these are your sellouts. Whatever the white man said, these dudes was in support of it. Long live Herod! He could do no wrong. So the Herodians were Jews who supported Herod. Did y'all write that down? Because you'll be reading later on, who are the Herodians? Who are the stay? Yeah, read it again. Herodians. A party, of, a party mentioned in the, New, in the New Testament three times as joining with the Pharisees to oppose Jesus. Jews who supported the dynasty of Herod and therefore the rule of Rome. Y'all see that? Now, right. So here's another one. Let's get another. Get me Acts 13 verse 1. You brothers pay attention. You sisters too. And when y'all read this, you got to remember the Bible is history. Not only is it prophecy, but it's history. History, history, our history, and how we dealt with everyone and what they did to us. Acts 13 and verse 1. Acts 13 and 1. Everybody get it, get it, get it. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Nigger and Lucius of Cyrene. I know some of y'all got offended at that name Nigger. And all it means is Latin, it means black, that's it. It was a nickname, it meant black. It was pronounced nigger. Recently they started changing the, don't pronounce it that way, say Niger. So it's less offensive. 
Look, nigga. <laughs> it's Latin for black. I'm sorry. Read on. And Lucius of Cyrene. And Man Ma This Mana is the part I want you to pay attention to. This is the part right here. Come on. And Mana N, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Which now, and Mana, now, Cy uh, what is it? Lucius of Cyrene and Mana, Mana N. Now, these are Israelites, but watch this. Which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Who was Saul? Saul, Saul. It's the same Paul. Right, this is Paul. He later became Paul. So now, read that again, Captain. Pay attention, pay attention. And give me the genealogy again. Acts 13 and verse 1. Now that we're in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Nigger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Right, which had been brought up with... Look for Acts. Do you see it up there? My side ain't that good. You see Acts 13 and 1 up there? Oh, right there. That's it. Right there. It says, Herod Antipas Tetrarch of Galilee. Right there. So these are all Edomites. So when we read in Acts 13 and 1, Herod the Tetrarch was an Edomite. Read that again, Isaac. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Nigger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So what? They mean is what? They went to school together. Remember they had schools of learning. When the white man took over, we were forced, our people were forced to go to school with them. Okay? We went to the same schools and learning scriptures. From there, get me... Uh, Acts 25 and 23. The book of Acts, chapter 25 and verse 23. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. So now Paul was brought forth before, who was it? It said, uh... I want you to look at the name Agrippa and Bernice. Go ahead. With great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city. At Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. Now, get me the scripture. It might be right there where Paul begins to speak. Where is it? 26. 26. Okay, let's start at verse 1. So now, remember, it's Agrippa and you got Bernice, right? Now, and Festus, read. Acts 26 and verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Remember, Agrippa is what race is he? Edomites. Edomites, read. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Especially, here it is, because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. How was Agrippa expert in all questions and customs concerning the Jews? He went to the schools. He went to our schools to learn about us. Everybody with me? Now, on the map, show me Bernice and Agrippa. There's a lot of Bernice. I see several names up there. Okay. Go down. Go down. You should have the script. Acts 25 right there. You got Herod Agrippa right there. Right on that line. Right. Right there. You see Herod Agrippa. And to the left, you got Bernice had a relationship with the Emperor Titus. So all these people, these, what you're reading about, these were converts calling themselves Jews because that's what all of them, the whole Herodian line, beginning with who? I, Idumians who claimed noble ancestry in the return against accusations of lineage to Philistine slaves, commander under Alexander Joannes. Now, what you don't, what they don't tell you here is that Antipater them, they were the first converts to Judaism. They were the first converts. 
That's why I said Agrippa was expert in all things. That's why they made the Herods kings over the lands of the Israelites. They got circumcised. You can read about this in history. John Hycranus, which was the son of which one? Was it Jonathan or Simon? Simon. John Hycranus, the son of Simon Maccabee, forced them to become circumcised and to learn the customs of Israel. That's what happened historically. You can write that name down. John Hycranus. H-Y. How do you spell that? H-Y-R-C-A-N-U-S. Okay. Now, let's go back now. Revelation 2 and 9. Revelation 2 and 9. The book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. So now historically you should know who that's talking about. That is not talking about the scribes and Pharisees. Were the scribes and Pharisees Jews? Yes. So who was calling themselves Jews and were not? But are who, Isaac? But are the synagogue of Satan. So who's that during the time of Christ and the apostles? Who is that? Hello, bro. It was Herod. Right. The entire Her Herod's line, brother. This is why we kept it up on the screen for you. This is why I went over and said that these were converts. The entire line of Herod beginning with Antipater. Write it down. So that way when you get home, you can read the history slowly to yourselves. All right? The whole family line of Herod. That's why we went to Acts 26 about Agrippa. When it said Agrippa was expert in all the customs and questions of the Jews. How come? He was a, a what? He was a so-called Jewish convert. Okay? Everybody with us so far? All right? If I'm losing, don't be ashamed to say, listen, I'm a little lost. Can you go back a little bit? I'll go back. All right? Revelation 2, 9 again. Revelation 2, verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So the entire line of Herod, beginning with Antipater, they were converts, calling themselves Jews. That's why it said Herod was king of what? Judea. All right, he was a convert. Now, so after this time, Rome fell. And what year did Rome fell? Who can tell me? Rome fell. What year? What year? With Ezra in the back. 193 AD. Very good. 193 AD. Keep standing, Ezra. Who overthrew Rome? Uh, Septimius Severus. Septimius Severus. Very good. Write that down. Rome fell in 193 AD under the hand of Septimius Severus. That's who overthrew him. He was a Roman gladiator, a black man, a Jew. All right? From there, give me Wisdom of Solomon 718. You just uh, mentioned that about the gladiators, right? Uh-huh. Who was the brother that just answered the, answered the question? Ezra, stand up. The point that you just, repeat what you just said earlier. Repeat the answer that you just gave the elder. Uh, Rome fell in 193 AD. Okay. By the leader of Septimius Severus. Now, my question is, how did those, how, how did the, Severus Septimius, where did he come from? Uh, I think. What was, what was his nationality? What was he? He was an Israelite. Of okay. Where did he come from? How did, how did, how did he get in there? Uh, in 70 AD, Rome killed all the Jews. Not all of them, but the rest of them, they put them in slavery. And, they were, and basically, he was a slave. Okay, 70, you said that Rome killed all the Jews. Give me the history about how did they, where did they, before they came, in, how did they get into Rome? That's what I'm asking you. Uh, in order for them to overthrow Rome, they had to, they had to come into Rome. Yeah. What is the history that brought them into Rome? That's what I'm asking. Uh, they was brought in as slaves and to be gladiators from, in the games. From what period they were brought in? From so You said they were brought in as slaves from where? From Judea. If they were not in Rome, where were they? In Judea. Okay, so what happened in Judea that got, this, got them into Rome? Uh, Rome made an end to the Jewish state. And okay, what is it? Okay, you're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's the number, that's the name you want to put on it. Yeah. Okay, that's what happened. 
Give me that, Luke 21, 24. Just to see prophetically the history behind that. The book of Luke, chapter 21 and verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Meaning the Jews fell by the edge of the sword. Read. And shall be led away captive into all nations. That's how a large remnant of them got into Rome. Go ahead. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. So even Christ, again, is telling you the people in Jerusalem is not the Jews. Those are Gentiles that's living there. You want to know why the white man that calls himself a Jew rejects the New Testament? It condemns him. We just read Revelation 2. Now, they don't want that. This is talking about us. An ye, an ye. Okay, from there. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7 and verse 18. The beginning, ending, and midst of times. Read the verse before. Wisdom of Solomon, 7 and verse 17. For he hath given me certain knowledge. The Most High gave King Solomon certain knowledge. Read. Of the things that are, namely, to know how the world was made. So God shows Solomon how the world was made. Read. And the operation of the elements. He shows Solomon how the elements operated. That's on a level we have yet to come to. Read. The beginning. He shows Solomon the beginning of times. Ending. He shows Solomon the end of times. And the midst of and the, the times. And the midst, meaning the middle times, meaning the middle ages. He shows Solomon that too. From there, give me Malachi. Chapter 1, verse 4, Malachi. I'm going to show you how Malachi coincides with what Solomon said about seeing the midst of times, meaning the middle of times. The middle ages. The book of Malachi, chapter 1 and verse 4. Whereas Edom saith. Who are we reading, my brothers? Edom. Read. We are impoverished. We are impoverished. We ain't got nothing. But we will return and build the desolate places. Read it. Re write this down. When it says we will rebuild the desolate places, it's referring to the renaissance. The word renaissance means what? Rebirth. Rebirth, Rebirth of what? The white man in power in the earth, which began in 1453. 1453. Read it again, Captain. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. Now that's the part I want to pause right there. We are impoverished. The impoverished part, because those of you who've read the Bible, where Edomites, when you read in Genesis, were they broke and destitute? What were they? It says they were rich. When you read Genesis 36, Esau was the first dukes on earth. They said they was rich and wealthy. So how did they become impoverished? What we read in Malachi 1.4, they became impoverished during the Middle Ages. Now, this is a report that came out March 18th, 2014. Blow it up big so we can see it. Pay attention. Now, we're, we're reading this because some of you only believe if the white man tells you. You don't believe if the Bible tells you, so let's let the white man tell you. Then remind me to tell him a message after we read this. <clears throat> Leaked report. Israel acknowledges Jews in fact Khazars. Secret plan for reverse migration to Ukraine. Uh, our Russian and Ukrainian correspondents, Hirsch, Ostabler, and Gross Spas, also contributed to the story that laid due to the crisis over the Crimean referendum. Fast-breaking developments. Followers of Middle Eastern affairs know two things. Always expect the unexpected and never write off Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who has more political lives than the proverbial cat. Only yesterday came news that Syrian rebels plan to give Israel the Golan Heights in exchange for creation of a no-fly zone against the Assad regime. In an even bolder move, it is now revealed Israel will withdraw its settlers from communities beyond the settlement blocks and relocate them at least temporarily to Ukraine. Now, you know all of them ain't going. A small remnant's going to go. Don't think all of them going, because they ain't. They're going to hold on to the lie that they think they're Jews. Go ahead. Ukraine made this arrangement on the basis of historic ties and in exchange for desperately needed military assistance against Russia. This surprising turn of events had an even more surprising origin. Genetics, a field in which Israeli scholars have long excelled. A warlike Turkic people and a mystery. 
It is well known that sometime in the 8th to 9th centuries, the Khazars, a warlike Turkic people, converted to Judaism and ruled over a vast domain in what became southern Russia and Ukraine. Do y'all hear what the white man's writing to you? Now, I'm only reading, this don't mean nothing to me, but some of you only believe if the white man say it. So we're going to read what the white man say just for you. Co-signed by the white man. Co-signed by the white man. Go ahead. What happened to them after the, the Russians did. destroyed that empire around the 11th century has been a mystery. What happened to them after the Russians destroyed that empire around the 11th century has been a mystery. Read. Many have speculated that the Khazars became the ancestors of Ashkenazi Jews. So they're telling you that these so-called Ashkenazi Jews are from the Khazar Empire from the Middle Ages time. Go Arabs ahead. have long cited the Khazar hypothesis in attempts to deny a Jewish historical claim to the land of Israel. That's why the Palestinians have always been against them. When you read, what's his name? Ibn... Gamal Abdul Nasser. Nasser. He said in the Six Day War, how did the Jews leave Israel black and come back white? That's during the Six Day War, and Israel blew him to hell and back just for that. But this is what it's talking about here. Where was that? Arabs have long cited that the Khazar hypothesis and attempts to deny a Jewish historical claim to the land of Israel. Because the Arabs know the history. They ain't gonna tell you that you're the real Jews, but they're gonna say, no, these white people are not the Jews. They'll go as that far. Go ahead. During the UN debate over Palestine partition, Kaim Wiseman responded sarcastically, it is very strange. All my life I have been a Jew, felt like a Jew, and I now learn that I am a Khazar. So this is the white man that calls himself, he says, wait a minute, this is odd. I always thought I was a Jew. Now you're telling me I'm a Khazar? Go ahead. In a more folksy vein, Prime Minister Golda Meir famously said, Khazar. Golda Meir, Golda Meir. Golda, Golda Meir famously said, Khazar Shmazar, there is no Khazar people. I knew no Khazars in Kiev or Milwaukee. Show me these Khazars of whom you speak. Look in the mirror. <laughs> Contrarian Hungarian. Ex-communist and scientist Arthur Kostler. Write that name down, Arthur Kostler. Write that name down. Go ahead. Brought the Khazar hypotheses to a wider audience with the 13th tribe, 1976. So Arthur Kostler was an Ashkenazi Jew. He did research on his history, and he found something amazing. Read. In the hope that disproving a common Jewish Racial identity would end anti-Semitism. Clearly, that hope has not been fulfilled. Right. He wrote the book to kill anti-Semitism, to prove that they're the Jews once and for all. When he did his research, he said, wait a minute. Something ain't going right now with my research. That's why it says, clearly that hope has not been fulfilled. Read. Most recently, left-wing Israeli historian Shlomo Sands, the invention of the Jewish people, took Kostler's, Kostler's thesis in a direction he had not intended, arguing that because Jews were a religious community descended from converts... Descended from who? Descended from converts... They are telling you they are descended from converts. They are not the biblical Jews. They are not the biblical Israelites. Go ahead. They do not constitute a nation or need a state of their own. He said that land don't belong to them. This is what the white man's telling you. Go ahead. Wait. This right here was put up because a Negro would never touch this site here. He would never come across anything like this at all. Huh? I'm telling you, he's into world star hip hop and stuff like that. He won't touch none of this. The NBA draft. Yeah, go ahead. Scientists, however, dismissed the Khazar hypothesis because the genetic evidence did not add up. Now, I always tell y'all about that, uh, what is it called? That DNA genetic is garbage, straight up garbage. In order to be descendant of King David, what do you need DNA wise? You gotta have King David's DNA. They don't got King David's DNA. That's the lie button, they fool people all over the world. DNA, DNA. Elder, I, I, I always, uh, to, to put it another way, what, you, what you're basically saying, whenever they do these things, the source DNA 
is based on the belief that these people are the Jews. Right. So they'll take the oldest Khazar bones that they could find right. and say, see, these are the Jews. So they're making the presumption that those are the Jews. Exactly. So it's never accurate. They're going based on today's understanding. Exactly. Go ahead. Scientists, however, dismissed the Khazar hypothesis because the genetic evidence did not add up until now. In 2012, Israeli researcher Iran el Haik published a study claiming to prove that Khazar ancestry is the single largest element in the Ashkenazi gene pool. Mm. Sand declared himself vindicated, and progressive organs such as Haaretz, Haaretz and the forward trumpeted the results. Israel seems finally to have thrown in the towel. They said, we give up. <laughs> a blue ribbon team of scholars from leading research institutions and museums has just issued a secret report what to kind the of government. What report? A, a secret report to the government acknowledging that European Jews are in fact Khazars. Khazars. This is still the people of Herod calling themselves Her uh, Khazars during the Middle Ages. Herod babies. Go ahead. Whether this would result in yet another proposal to revise the words to Hatkeva remains to be seen. At first sight, this would seem to be the worst possible news, <laughs> given the Prime Minister's relentless insistence on the need for Palestinian recognition of Israel as a Jewish state and the stagnation of the peace talks. But others have underestimated him at their peril. An aid quip, when life hands you an etrog, you build a sukkah. Speaking off the record, he explained, we first thought that admitting we are really Khazars was one way to get around Abba's insistence that no Jew could remain in a Palestinian state. Maybe we were grasping at straws, but when he refused to accept that, it forced us to think about more creative solutions. The Ukrainian invitation for the Jews to return was a godsend. Relocating all the settlers within Israel in a short time would be difficult for reasons of logistics and economics. We certainly don't want another fashlan like the expulsion of the settlers in the Gaza hit nakut, disengagement. We're not talking about all the Ashkenazi Jews going back to Ukraine. Obviously, that is not practical. That's why I told you, all of them ain't going back. Go ahead. Speaking on deep background, a well-placed source in intelligence circles said, we're not talking about all the Ashkenazi Jews going back to Ukraine. Obviously, that is not practical. The press, as usual, exaggerates and sensationalizes. This is why we need military censorship. Because <laughs> there was a secret report that got out. Go ahead. Kezaria 2.0. All Jews who wish to return would be welcomed back without condition as citizens. The more so if they take part in the promised infusion of massive, is in massive Israeli military assistance, including troops, equipment, and construction of new bases. If the initial transfer works, other West Bank settlers would be encouraged to re relocate to Ukraine as well. After Ukraine, bolstered by this support, reestablishes control over all its territory, the current autonomous Republic of Crimea would once again become an autonomous Jewish domain. The small-scale successor to the medieval empire of Khazari. Notice it says the medieval empire of Khazari, because that's where that term comes from, the Middle Ages. Go ahead as the peninsula too was once known, would be called in Yiddish, Kazerai. The Khazars did not have to live within Auschwitz borders. As you know, the spokesman continued, the prime minister has said time and again, we are a proud and ancient people whose history here goes back 4,000 years. The same is true of the Khazars, just back in Europe and not, and not quite as long. But look at the map. The Khazars did not have to live within Auschwitz borders. Auschwitz is where they said Hitler was burning them up. Go ahead. As the prime minister has said, no one will tell Jews where they may or may not live on the historic territory of their existence. Because they're ruling everything right now. Go ahead. As a sovereign people. He is willing to make painful sacrifices for peace, even if that means giving up part of our biblical homeland in Judea and Samaria. Their biblical homeland of Judea and Samaria. Now, give me that real quick, Ezekiel. Ezekiel uh, 35, 10 to 15. What we just read, now we're going to read it in the prophecy, in the Bible. Go ahead. Because thou hast said. Because thou hast, the thou there is Esau, Idumia. Let's prove that. 35. Get 35, 36 and 5. Ezekiel 36 and 5. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumia, which have appointed my land into their possession. You see that? The Bible prophesies Idumia would take our land. Now go back to 36, 34, uh, no, 35 and 10, I'm sorry. Ezekiel, 35 and 10. Uh -huh. Because thou hast said. Because thou, Idumia, has said, because that's what's talking about, Idumia. These two nations. These two nations. Now, originally it was Judea and Samaria. But it's really going into uh, Judah and Israel. Go ahead. And these two countries. Meaning the land of Israel and the land of America today. Shall be mine. And we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. Hold on, hold on. What was the statement that the elder just made concerning those two lands? What was it you said? These two nations and these two? Repeat what you just said. Oh, I said Judah and Samaria. Okay, we got that part. Then uh, Israel and America. Israel and America. To show you why this book is now $1,000. What are you talking about? As opposed, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lay it out. As opposed to $13. Lost tribes and the promised lands. That devil knew the scriptures. For him to say that America was part of the promised land, he's, he knew the scripture. Right. That's what that book by Ronald Sanders is talking about. When it says lost tribes and the promised lands, what lands were they talking about? When they're talking about a tribe discovered in New York. He's talking about America. So he's saying that America is part of those promised lands. Why? Because the Israelites are here as well. Exactly. That's what that's see. That's what I'm saying. These these scholars, bro, they do their research and they put it on the titles of books and Negroes be sitting there don't know what the hell they're looking at. Exactly. We don't. Verse eleven. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, envy which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. Stop. A lot of you may believe or think that you have good Jewish friends and Christian friends. The Bible, you gotta look at what God says. Read verse 11 again. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger. First word you gotta look at is anger. They had anger against us, read. And according to thine envy. Then it says they had envy against us, read. Which thou has used out of thy hatred. The next word is hatred against us, read. Against them. And I will make myself known among them. So what I want y'all to see, because although they may treat some of us nice and do certain things for us, the Bible says they have anger against us, envy, and hatred. That's why they comfortably took our nationality. Put us in a ghetto, and they're raining on top. That's all anger, envy, and hate. And give you a crumb. You want welfare? Some welfare. They that's, put you in a slum house somewhere. That's why they said no to the reparations after they heard about it. They said, exactly. wait a minute, we made a mistake. <laughs> exactly. Right. The envy is they want to be God's chosen people. We don't, Captain. When I have judged thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies. All thy blasphemies. On ye Yehudi. I am a Jew. I am a Christian. Go ahead. Which thou has spoken against the mountains of Israel. This land is our land. Go ahead. Saying, they are laid desolate. They are given us to consume. Thus with your mouth ye have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. As thou didst rejoice at the inheritance of the house of Israel. Because it was desolate. We went into slavery. That's why it was desolate. Read. So will I do unto thee. I'm going to do that to you. Go ahead. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir. Mount Seir. Go ahead. And all Idumia. All who? All Idumia. We've been reading about the Idumians all this time. Go ahead. Even all of it. And they shall know that I am the Lord. And he didn't say some Idumians. How many? All. all. That goes for your little friend Becky. Your little friend... Uh, we want to say, y'all say, Miss Laura. Y'all say goodbye to Miss Laura now. Boom! She's finished, yes. In Ezekiel 11, the recent proof just happened to that with Sterling. In that yes. conversation. Exactly. He demonstrated his anger, his hate, and his envy That's right. towards his own place. Exactly. That's He's a present so example Jew. in 2014. That's right. Read that. 
As the Prime Minister has said, no one will tell Jews where they may or may not live on the historic territory of their existence as a sovereign people. Mm. He is willing to make painful sacrifices for peace, even if that means giving up part of our biblical homeland in Judea and Samaria. But then you have to expect us to exercise our historical rights somewhere else. We decided this would be on the shores of the Black Sea, where we were an Auto I don't even know Auto that. Auto Auto colonist people for more than 2,000 years. Now, what's on the Black Sea? Who knows what's around the Black Sea? Now the elder that went deep on you. What's near the Black Sea? The Caucasus Mountain. Uh, see that? that, that. He's been learning and reading. That's right. That's right. The Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. Saying go back there because that's where they come from. Come on. Hey, just a note. The autocononist means indigenous. Oh, okay. Where we were in a, an indigenous So it says when we were an indigenous people for more than two So they're saying years. they were indigenous they were the, people in the Caucasus Mountains. Yes. Yes. That's what they're saying. Even the great you nuns. Know, oh, hold, hold. You got to repeat what you just said. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That, just started. They no, just no, 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 no. They did not get that. They did not get that. Word <laughs> they did not get that. Say all of that again. The word. They are indigenous to what? Uh, indigenous to the Caucasus Mountains. That's what he's saying. So what does that mean? That that's their homeland. <laughs> that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. He's telling you that they're the Edomites. That's what he's saying. Yep. Go ahead. Even the great non-Zionist historian. Simon Dubnow said we had the right to colonize Crimea. It's in all the history books. You can look it up. We'd like to think of it as a sort of a homeland away from home, <laughs> added the anonymous intelligence source, or the original one. He said with a wink, after all, Herzl wrote about the old new land, didn't he? And the transition shouldn't be too difficult for the settlers because, you know, they still get to feel as if they are pioneers, experience danger, construct new housing, carry weapons. The women can continue to wear scarves on their heads, and the food won't be very different from what they already eat. In retrospect, we should have seen this coming, said a venerable State Department Arabist, ticking off the signs on his fingers. A little notice report that Russia was cracking down on Israeli smuggling of Khazar artifacts. The decision of both Spain and Portugal to give citizenship to descendants of their expelled Jews, as well as evidence that former IDF soldiers were already leading militias in support of the Ukrainian government. Hold on. The decision of both Spain and Portugal to give citizenship to their descendants of their expelled Jews. When you read in history, there's a group of people called Moranos which were Jewish converts who were forced to become Christians. Columbus was one of them. Christopher Columbus was one of them. Acu accused by Agrippa I of treason before Caligula, banished to Spain. Right, there was a lot of them in Spain. There were Jewish converts who were forced to become Christians later on. And also in the Lost Tribes and Promised Land, uh, I forgot the guy's name, but the missionary that found the tribes, the reason he was able to speak to them is he considered himself a Morano. Right. So he knew the Hebrew when they spoke to him in Hebrew. Exactly. Exactly. Can we blow Montezino, that up kind of big? Montezinos. That's what it was. Can we blow that up kind of big so we can see it? Okay. Let's read that, bro. Read that. Yes. Absolute proof. More modern Jews, not biblical Israelites. Now, you might look at us. Oh, you guys are racist. This is what we're going over. This ain't racism. This is truth. We went to the Bible. Now we're going to history books. I want you men to understand that. I know there's a Christian sitting up in here somewhere, angry, dinerly. When is the SH going to be over? Go ahead. The 13th tribe by Arthur Kostler, suicided by Mossad. Now we're going to deal with that suicide also. Okay. Uh-huh. Just, what did he say? The 13th tribe. <laughs> see, see what I'm saying? They slipped. How many tribes is there in Israel? So why is this man saying 13? Because if the white man is going to be a Jew, you'd have to add another tribe to the nation of Israel because he's not a Jew. That's what he's saying. See, exactly. that, the title doesn't skip past people. Let's read. Explains the creation of the European Khazar Ashkenazi Jews who are descended from Huns, not Semitic peoples. From Dick Eastman, 215.10. Now, I got to pause right there. I got to pause right there. I have a question. 
There is one, there is an error in that. Here's my question. Are, is the white man a Shemitic or Semitic people? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Real quick, go to First Chronicles, chapter 1. I, I just want to show you that. See, don't think we just jump on something and go, oh, yeah, that gets the white man, so we're going to read it. No, if there's an error, we're going to point it out. Say, nope, that part right there ain't right. Uh, I think it's verse 34 I want, but I want to start above it. Find me, Shem. Start at 24. First, the first book of Chronicles, chapter 1 and verse 24. Shem, of Farksad, Shalah, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Sarug, Nahar, Torah, Abram. The same is Abraham. So what I want you to see out of that is that Abraham comes from who? Shem. The word Sem is the same as Shem. Semitic is Shemitic. It's the same word. The word Shem is a Hebrew word which means name. Like you may hear so-called Jewish people say Hashem. They call God Hashem. It simply means the name. Write that down. Somebody will talk to you on the street, you'll be like, huh? You know damn well we went over it. So, now, about Shem, his descendants. Abraham is a descendant of who? Shem. Jump down and get to the point. Verse 34. Verse 34. And Abraham begat Isaac, the sons of Isaac, Esau and Israel. So, you see, Esau comes from Abraham also. So, guess what Esau is? He is Shemitic. He is a Semite, a Shemite. So, now, there, and let's, guess what, brothers? There's a lot of Shemitic families. Ishmael, the Arabs, they said, when someone, the white man says, you are anti-Semitic, they know you don't know no history because you should be able to blast the hell out of them. Not only is the white man Shemitic, we are Shemitic. The Chinese are Shemitic. The Japanese are Shemitic. The Arabs are Shemitic. The Palestinians are Shemitic. They all come from Shem. That's the point. Right. They all descend from Shem. There's a lot of families from Shem. But because our people don't know history, they pull a wool over your eyes. You're an anti-Semite. You're going to get in trouble now. No, you right. demons. The point that Arthur Kosler was making, I, I remember reading there were some comments that was written on the cover of the book. And one of them spoke about the term anti-Semitism. And what he was saying, he, wasn't he was not necessarily dealing with all of the tribes that came out of Shem. He was speaking about the term anti-Semitism. He was saying that it had, if this comes to light, meaning the truth about these people not being Jews, the term anti-Semitism would become void of meaning. That's, that's the point that he, he was uh, further going into. But in the reality, they, all of them are Shemites. Right. They'd call all it's, of the Palestinians right. anti-Semites. The Palestinians are Shemitic. They are Semites. They descend from Shem. Let's read on, Captain. Right there. Arthur Kosler and his wife were killed by Mossad shortly after releasing this book. So after he wrote, the so-called Jewish man wrote this book, him and his wife was murdered, but it made it look like a suicide. Mossad means is uh, a Jewish, so-called Jewish intelligence group. They go out and do undercover work and murder people. That's what Mossad is. It's the Israeli, the CIA, Israeli right. CIA. Yes. It's like the equivalent of the CIA. Right. As expected, the 13th tribe caused a stir when published in 1976. Now, they got several versions. The first version is what y'all want to get, the 1976 version. They got new versions where they take a lot of stuff out. Get the original version. Go ahead. Since it demolishes ancient racial and ethnic dogmas, at the height of the controversy in 1983, the lifeless bodies of Arthur Kostler and his wife were found in their London home. Despite significant inconsistencies, the police ruled their death a suicide. Right. They said there was a lot of proof that it wasn't suicide. They said, nope. Call it a suicide. Suicide. They, in other words, they went to the crime scene, found a knife in his back, <laughs> took the knife out to get rid of this. He, he, suicide. <laughs> yeah. And sprinkle a little crack on it. Sprinkle a little crack on it. <laughs> <laughs> Another Mossad suicide. Uh, the 13th tribe, the Khazar Empire and its heritage. This book traces the history of the ancient Khazar Empire, 
a major but almost forgotten power in Eastern Europe, which in the Dark Ages became converted to Judaism. Khazaria was finally wiped out by the forces of Genghis Khan, but evidence indicates that the Khazars themselves migrated to Poland and formed a cradle of Western Jewry. The Khazar sway extended from the Black Sea. Did we just read about the Black Sea brothers? They said y'all should go back to the Black Sea. Watch this, read it again. The Khazar sway extended from the Black Sea to the Caspian, from the Caucasus to the Volga. Those are Caucasus Mountains to the Volga Mountains. Right? And they were instrumental in stopping the Muslim onslaught against Byzantium, the eastern jaw of the gigantic pincer movement that in the west swept across northern Africa and into Spain. Pause right there. What I want y'all to see, it says they were instrumental in stopping the Muslim onslaught. When you read about the Middle Ages and you read about the Moors, the word Moor means what, brothers? Black. That's all it means. Not only did you have Israelites who were Muslims, you had Israelites who were Moors calling themselves Christians, you had Israelites who were Moors calling themselves Jews, Israelites calling themselves Moors who were Muslim. Now, let me show you something. I got a book. I got a book. I got a book. I need somebody to hold that mic. Now, this book here is called Art Treasures, Treasures of Russia. Text by M.W. Alpatov. I need two brothers. Get a line. And uh, Mike, get a line, Mike. I want you to come up. And don't rip my book. Arts of Russia, published by the Nago Company. Arts of Russia. I'm going to show you a picture about, what did we just read? It said the Khazars sway and they were instrumental in stopping the Muslim onslaught against Byzantium. I want to show you Byzantium. Now, the name of this painting, this was done near the end of the in 1500s. Now, it's, the name of this painting is called the Church Militant. Now, it says in 1552, the Tsar, Ivan the Terrible, y'all heard of Ivan, Ivan the Terrible? defeated the Tartar Horde. The Tartar Horde, I'm gonna read it, the Tartar Horde, and captured the city of Kazan. Kazan was the capital of the Khazar Empire. That's what I want y'all to understand. So now, this is before they were converting to what we wanted them to convert to, because we needed them uh, militarily to have our back on that end. I'm gonna keep on reading. It was a victory of the cross over the crescent. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump down. Christ's armed horsemen advancing in triple rank. Show them the triple ranks. One of y'all got a free hand. There's three rows. There's three rows. Triple. In the top row, I'm going to read it. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to read this part. Listen good. Christ's armed horsemen advancing in triple rank toward the heavenly city. Listen good. Symbolize the Russian people, God's chosen ones, the new Israel. Who is God's chosen ones that y'all see? What color are they? They're black. Now I'm going to read down. In the top row of warriors, Dmitry Donskov is followed by his patron saint, Demetrius of, I, I can't pronounce these names. Let me just jump down. Okay, middle row. Look at the middle row, y'all. Um, it says, in the middle row of warriors, the archangel Michael, surrounded by a glory and mounted on a winged red horse. Point to it. Point to it. That's the archangel right, Michael is urging the warriors on. Listen good. His head is turned toward Ivan the Terrible. Point to who Michael is looking right. at. Let point so when the elder make these points, illustrate, because the people at home watching, that's they, they don't see it. That's Michael. Now you point to Ivan, them. right, that's Ivan the Terrible. A lot of y'all thought Ivan the Terrible was a white man. You left all your lives thinking Ivan the Terrible was a white man. This history is showing you they were black. I'm going to read on. Let me read on. Let me get now, to this. What they don't realize is that Negroes didn't write these books. Exactly. This is a book from Russia itself. Exactly. Look, this is art treasure from art treasures of what is that? Arts of Russia. of Russia. Okay. It says his head is turned toward Ivan the Terrible, astride a gray horse. So Ivan is on a gray horse. Behind him, foot soldiers with shields are watched over by a man on horseback, um, who holds a scepter in the form of a cross. Point to the man holding a cross in his hand. It's a scepter. You see it right there? Can you get in closer? It tells you who it is. This is Vladimir II. Vladimir. Y'all heard of 
Prince Vladimir and his sons Boris and Gleb? Exactly. It says it. Behind Vladimir II Monokov is a group of horsemen headed by Vladimir and his two sons, the martyrs Boris and Gleb. In the bottom row, point to the bottom row now, Alexander Nevsky, carrying a red banner, is riding in front of horsemen, go to the bottom row, whose saintly character is indi <coughs> indicated by their halos. St. George is just behind him. St. George. St. George the Dragon Slayer, right behind him. Y'all seen the icons of what we had, well, we, did a, we did a video called um, Iconoclasm, going many days without an image. Y'all remember that class? It's up on YouTube somewhere, it's somewhere out there, somewhere in our, in our arsenal of uh, videos. Right. And there's a, uh, there's a, there's a painting of St. George the Dragon Slayer, and, even, and ASAP, even Deacon ASAP pointed out how they painted over the blackness right. in, the, in, the, in the icon. And it showed it clear that right. underneath the fake layer, it was black skin. Exactly. Let me read on. Let me read on. I'm going go to go back to the top. In 1552, Tsar Ivan the Terrible de defeated the Tartar Horde. Tartar refers to the Turkish army, which is still Esau up there. It was a victory of the cross over the crescent, meaning victory of Christianity over Islam. Uh, this was called also the Crusades. At the icon's right in a circle of flames, point to that, on the right there's a, a, a circle with a castle on fire. You see that city on fire, right? Watch this. It says, at the icon's right in a circle of flames is Sodom, which symbolizes Kazan. Kazan is the capital of Kazaria. This is where Esau was. We burnt them out. We gave Esau hell. This is the history y'all don't know. You think it was white people fighting white people. Oh, no. That was us kicking everybody's behind. We warred on everybody around us till we conquered the earth. We ruled the earth. That's the history y'all don't know that they're keeping secret from you. Okay? Then it says, okay, at the left in a double glory is the heavenly city in front of which the virgin... That's supposed to be Mary in Christ. Point to it. The heavenly city. You see Mary? Go up, up, right in the center. Right, get that reflection off. You got Mary in Christ there. Right, black. Y'all got to get some of these books. I don't care how much it costs. Now get the books, because people call you a liar. No, we ain't lying. Okay, thank you. That was it. Now, we read about, we, he mentioned St. George, the dragon slayer. Now, in this next book, bear with me a second. Oh, here we go. This is, the, this is the book I showed originally, Art Treasures of Russia. Hold that up, Python. Open that. Oh, open it. Can y'all zoom in on This is St. George, the Dragon Slayer. Zoom in close. Look at St. George, the Dragon Slayer. And this was a sculpture, not a painting, a sculpture on a white horse. So don't say, oh, maybe he just turned black. Get in close on his face. Get in close. Where is this? Russia. 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 The last group of slaves, believe it or not, came from Russia. A lot of you think we only came from Africa. You dumb as hell. We came from all over because we was ruling all over. That's St. George the Dragon Slayer. Show him the dragon right under him, how he got his name. Go down. Pan down. Hold the book up. Hold the book up. Right. See it right there? That's how he got his name. He got a, a name. He killed some kind of a giant reptile that was at that time. And they called him St. George the the dragon slayer. So now we burnt out the city of Kazan, which was the capital of Kazar, is what we're reading about when we made them convert to being Jews. Do y'all see this? Okay, all praise. I don't want y'all getting lost now. All right, read that, that part. We're almost done. I ain't going to. The have Kazar it sway extended from the Black Sea to the Caspian, from the Caucasus to the Volga, and they were instrumental in stopping the Muslim onslaught against Byzantium, the eastern jaw of the gigantic pincer movement. Right, we used them uh, militarily to help us. That's what we did. That in the west swept across northern Africa and into Spain. Because we was ruling from northern Africa into Spain. Go ahead. In the second part of this book, The Heritage, Mr. Kostler speculates about the ultimate faith of the Khazars and their impact on the racial composition and social heritage of modern Jewry. He produces a large body of meticulously detailed research in support of a theory that sounds all the more convincing for the restraint with which it is advanced. Scroll down. Come on, scroll down. 
Yet, should this theory be confirmed, this the, you was about your the term anti-Semitism would become void of meaning. Right. If everybody found out, you see what he's saying, that they are not the Jews of the Bible, anti-Semitism would become void of meaning. People would be like, listen, you don't know what you're talking about. Go ahead. Since, as Mr. Kosler writes, it is based on a misapprehension shared by both the killers and their victims. The story of the Khazar Empire, as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. So, I want you this they're saying this is the most cruel hoax history has ever perpetrated. Cruel hoax. Where's that in the Bible? A cruel hoax. Give me Isaiah 20, 29 and 16, I think. Isaiah 29 and verse is it 16. Verse uh, 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel. They have hid the counsel. Their counsel was they made us niggas and spicks and native Indians. They set themselves up as the Jews. Read it again. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. All their works are in the dark because they made us slaves. And, and the other nations were in cahoots with them. Read. And they say, who seeth us? Who seeth us? And who knoweth us? And who knows us that we are the Khazars, we are the people of Herod, we are Idumians, Edomites. Read. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. What can you do with potter's clay? You can shape it any way you want. They turn the clay upside down. God said, I'm going to make it the right way it's supposed to be. That's what the Bible is. You men understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let's see that map. Y'all see the Black Sea there? Right between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea is the Caucasus Mountains. That's why they call themselves Caucasian. When they say American Caucasian, Spanish Caucasian, Jewish Caucasian, Russian Caucasian, it comes from the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia, right there. Right there, that's where they come from. Thereafter, the Khazars found themselves in a precarious position between the two major world powers the Eastern Roman Empire in Byzantium. That was Jake, that was Israelites. Mm -hmm. right? And the triumphant followers of Muhammad. So you had Christianity fighting against Islam. Go ahead. As Arthur Kostler points out, the Khazars were the third world of their day. And they chose a surprising method of resisting both the Western pressure to become Christian and the Eastern to adopt Islam. Rejecting both, they converted to Judaism. Y'all hear the history behind this? This is history we're reading. You got more detail? I got more detail. Come on with it. This is out of the book entitled Pictor Picture History of Jewish Civilization. So who put this book together? So-called Jews. Well, let's see what they wrote. In this book on page 95, the section entitled The Khazars. Right. We're going to read some excerpts from this uh, section of the book. It says, the land of the Khazars in southern Russia extended from the Caspian Sea to the Black Sea, as far as the Crimea. It said, at the beginning of the eighth century, the Khazars became very strong by virtue of their domination of the trade route between the Byzantine Empire and the Far East. That's what we were just talking about in the uh, video. For this reason, both the Byzantine emperors and the Baghdad caliphs were interested in cultivating the Khazars and in bringing them under their influence by winning them over to their religion. Right. Paganism was on its last leg. Cajun Bullen of the Khazars, who reigned over his people in the middle of the 8th century, decided to abandon his pagan faith but could not make up his mind what new faith he would adopt or they would adopt. There are stories of the efforts of the Muslim Caliph and the Christian Emperor of Byzantium to win over the, over the Cajun to their belief. They sent delegations to him with letters and expensive gifts, accompanied by men learned in their religion to influence Bullen, meaning Cajun Bullen. The confused Cajun ordered a Christian and a Muslim to conduct a debate to establish whose faith was better. The debate lasted for a long time without concrete results. Hold on. This is going to explain how they converted. It says the, the, the Cajun noticed that both 
The Christians and the Muslim debaters referred to the Jewish Torah to support their arguments. Did y'all hear that? They were both using the scriptures. They were both using the Torah. It says, this being the case, the Cajun decided to adopt the faith of the Jews. He, he summoned a Jewish scholar to teach him the Torah. Bullen then had himself and his officers and soldiers circumcised. So I say that because I'm showing you how they became Jews. Because they weren't circumcising themselves or not. They were a bunch of nasty bums. When you read in that, in that book, they show that they used to eat lice. Crack the lice with their teeth. They refused to have anything to do with water. It says in that book. They were some nasty people. They, they wore underwear until it disintegrated from off their bodies. Y'all didn't hear what I said. They wore underwear until they said, and we refuse to have anything to do with water. We don't want to deal with it. <laughs> Elder, <laughs> can, I, can I point something out on the map so just so that they can understand? Because I read the book. That was one of the first books I read um, when I was um, studying um, this. So basically what they were saying is if you look at the layout, Byzantines here in the West, you had the Arabs over here in the east. You had the mountains in the way here, an ocean, an ocean. So to get at each other, all right, they would have to go through the water. And Kezaria is up here. So they wanted them, each of them wanted them as an ally because you had a direct route to come around and flank them. So it was all military strategy as to why they had that set up that way. So this became very important and integral in history. And for it to be that, and they were a third world country, that goes to show you that the Most High's hand was in all of that, all right? Because he said they were the third world of his day. So how did this third world country over here become such a major player, and yet the world hides that history from you? Because I didn't learn that in school. I learned about the Byzantium Empire. I didn't learn about these people. So when we go back to Malachi 1 and 4 again, history is good, especially when it filters through the Bible, because the Bible is the source of information. Do not leave the Bible. The book of Malachi, chapter 1 and verse 4. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. So when they started to build again, it was during the Renaissance era, the Renaissance. This is after Byzantium, after the Dark Ages, it became the the Renaissance in 1453, which means, Renaissance means what again, brothers? Rebirth. Rebirth of the white man and power in the earth. That's what it means. Go ahead. And they shall call them the border of wickedness. God says they're going to call them the border of wickedness. He said, read that again, Isaac. They shall rebuild in what? But we, they shall build, but I will throw down. So although they are building now, God says, I will throw down. You know God's a black man. He said, I'll throw down. <laughs> he's going to wipe all this out. That's what he's saying. So what are we reading? Bible prophecy, Bible history. Okay, this is not a hate campaign. This is what I want you to understand. This is history. This is truth. You go to work tomorrow, see your boss. Hey, Mr. whatever, Charles, Chuck, whatever, and keep it moving. Don't get an attitude. Don't spit on him. Don't punch him in the face. You got to control yourself. I know when you first hear this truth, you, you get angry. You don't know how to deal with the public. But you got to control yourself. Our time, the Most High is going to resurrect our people. I'm Elton Nathaniel, Israel United in Christ. YouTube likes to shut our channels down, as some of you have noticed, <laughs> ever so often. Subscribing to join IUIC will assure you will always stay connected to our YouTube accounts. We want to do our best to make sure this truth gets up. Please click and join our subscriber YouTube channel called Join IUIC to stay linked to all of our videos. So again, please make sure you subscribe to this and join IUIC channel to get your latest updates on all our YouTube channels. Shalom.